Mr. Ro Pastor, Foreign Minister. Hello, I'm Tom Dodd, the British Ambassador to Finland, and welcome to this seminar on whether Europe is going to be wealthier, healthier, and greener by 2030. And with me to discuss this important issue, I have some star guests. I have Teho Lesnan, State Secretary from the Finnish Environment Ministry, Jan Valbury, uh, the Finnish Climate Change Ambassador, and on the screen, live from UNSU, I have Mark Palahi, Director of the European Forestry um, Institute. Uh, so we're going to say a bit about uh, our perspectives for five minutes each. We'll then be inviting um, questions for points to make from the audience in a Q&A for the remainder of the session. And please tag, if, you're, if you are texting or tweeting, Europe Forumi or European Forum. To set the context, I see that we face three crises at the moment. We face a climate emergency. 2020 is likely to be the warmest or second warmest year the world has seen for, for, for millennia. Europe this year is two degrees warmer than it should be. Siberia in the first half of the year was seven degrees warmer than normal. This is extraordinary and we're well off track on the Paris Agreement targets. We also face a health emergency arising from the coronavirus epidemic. To date, 24 million cases, a million people have very sadly died across the world. And we're now beginning to see the second wave in a crisis which the head of the World Health Organization has said will go on for perhaps the next two years. It's also flagged the issue of health more widely in society since it's clear that other comorbidities increase mortality. So people who are obese, for example, are 50% more likely to die of coronavirus than those who are not. And finally, we're seeing a growing economic emergency. The world is set to contract economically by 5% this year. Uh, in Europe, it's going to be on average 10%, less in the north and more in the south. But that's one of the biggest hits to our global economy, really, since the World Depression. So what are we going to do about this? From a UK perspective, we are taking firm action. Domestically, we are spending in the short term only about 5 billion euros on greening the economy, uh, building greener housing, advancing green transport with a lot more to come. We have, for example, a 2 billion pound cycling and public health program, both health and green together. But most significantly, the UK in 2021 will be hosting with Italy the COP conference. And this is really a real opportunity to make a step forward in meeting these objectives in terms of fighting climate change and changing the way we behave. And this will be organized around themes of adaption and resilience, nature-based solutions, clean energy, clean transport, and green finance. Mm -hmm. And the UK, we are putting our money where our mouth is in our language. The conference will cost us at least 500 million euros to hold. Uh, we will put up an <coughs> ambitious national NDC in the short term, mm. and we'll end the use of coal by 2034, petrol-driven cars by 2035, and we'll be carbon neutral by 2050. And we're also going to be doubling the amount of uh, finance we're giving to climate change internationally to about 15 billion euros over the next five years. So some big national contributions. But actually, this is not just about how what we're doing is also about what other countries are doing. And so I'll hand over to Tehe to say a bit about what Finland's going to be doing. Thank you, Tehe. Many thanks, and, and thanks, uh, Tom, for organizing this, this event. And I'm, I'm very happy that Turku is organizing the Europe yes. Forum. And I just wanted to pause on the, on the situation, how, how this COVID-19 crisis has actually upended mm. uh, our societies closed our, mm. our borders, um, changed our political agendas. I, mean, I don't need to say, say that to a COP26 host, mm. uh, that where the COP26 has been postponed by a year. Um, our events um, just a month ago, uh, have, if I would have seen uh, 2030, a uh, Europe greener, uh, wealthier, healthier, I would have been uh, thinking, uh, talking some, about something else, a little different angle mm. than, uh, than recovery measures that we're taking. But, um, in this unprecedented situation, uh, the government, as you said, we have an economic crisis on top of the health crisis, and governments have needed to step in to su support their um, companies, uh, to keep companies, entrepreneurs, workers uh, afloat. But we also noticed that given the situation, um, 
there, there is a risk that investments that would have otherwise been occurring will not happen, and, and governments need to also step in for stimulating the economy and, and supporting the uh, investments. And as we, we know, and, and you know, uh, climate uh, change has not disappeared. We might have seen a little dip in emissions, but actually most, uh, or m at least many of the areas where we need to reduce emissions require investments, and the, the gap in investments is, is a serious issue. Uh, so we have to, uh, now that governments have, are stepping in, we have to make sure that we spend one euro can, whether it's one euro or a billion, it can only be used one, and we have to make sure that we use these resources wisely and, and to tackle the, the many crises w that we have at hand. And I would agree with your a list of crises, but I would also top up uh, with, with the biodiversity crisis, which is interlinked with, with climate crisis, but uh, equally serious. And, uh, now, tackling uh, the economic crisis uh, with green recovery measures is um, uh, the good news is that it's actually effective. It's been researched before uh, that um, green uh, recovery and stimulus measures are more effective uh, than others. The, the also, somehow, the good news is that we have the planning. Uh, we've worked on, on climate. We, we know what needs to be done. So we actually have an idea what needs to happen and perhaps this is actually a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to perhaps even leap uh, frog uh, on some of the investments when we now, as governments, need to, um, <coughs> need to step in. And it, you could see it from the other side as well. If we lose this opportunity, we throw this money now, we will be so in, in debt that we will never be able to do so again. So if this, we, we invest wrong now, the resources or the money in this world, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Um, now, our government, uh, my government, uh, recognized the, the need to do our uh, COVID-19 recovery and rebuild uh, in a manner that is consistent with our uh, government's objective for climate neutral Finland by 2035 uh, for uh, ecologically, uh, socially and economically sustainable society, circular economy. Um, already in May, uh, and we have already adopted some of the measures in, in our additional budgets that support this, and those are um, budgetary measures that already that we could identify that we can we can uh, put in place immediately, uh, and that we have already perhaps planned that we could uh, speed up, um, uh, like we we boosted our um, investment into um, home um, uh, energy. Uh, efficiency improvements for um, uh, for moving away from oil uh, heating in houses. We put a lot of um, uh, money into public and green uh, transport and green infrastructure already uh, in this year's uh, additional budget. But of course, now the European Union also made some important decisions this summer, and I'm happy to recognize that the the um, the, uh, the understanding that uh, uh, recovery needs to be consistent with our this this global crisis has also um, been recognized by the European leaders, and 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 there is a commitment that the recovery, the European recovery, will be consistent with the Paris Agreement mm. objectives, with consistent with our intention uh, to update our 2030 climate goals, mm. and also uh, governed by the principle of of do no harm. Uh, so. We are um, working on our plan. Um, my minister also already set up in early May um, a, an ad advisory group uh, to design and, and put forward and collect measures that uh, would uh, be good to stimulate the, the economy, would create jobs, but mm. also would support uh, climate objectives and support um, uh, nature and, and biodiversity objectives. So, um, we are very much working on it. Uh, we have a deadline uh, or, or intention to, to put mm. together uh, uh, a plan um, by October. And, uh, and as you know, in, uh, in this European context, we also, the European uh, leaders agreed that 30% of our um, uh, budget, our EU uh, mul multi-annual financial mm. framework will be spent on climate. Um, in that context, uh, there was also an understanding that this recovery um, facility would probably contribute around 40%. And, and my prime minister has already said that fi she thinks that uh, Finland will actually do more. So I, I'm rather uh, positive 
and, and hopeful that we are able to do an effective uh, recovery. And just, I, I realize I'm out of time probably, but um, uh, just to say that uh, my country has probably been uh, able to tackle this crisis um, fairly well, uh, be it uh, due to uh, great good uh, governance or a naturally socially distancing nature, mm -hmm. uh, but we're equally dependent on the recovery uh, of others. Our uh, economy is dependent on exports, and um, we know that uh, to tackle this crisis, we, we need the economy uh, to, to also recover, and we're, we're, we need others to, to come up from this crisis as okay. well. Thank you, thank you very much. So, Jan, that leads into the international picture. What, what's your perspective on, on the global side of things? Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks, Turku, for organizing this great event. Um, listening to you, I think it's used the context very well. I think it's a quadruple crisis, actually. It's health, it's environment, biodiversity, and it's also climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think we are heading in, in difficult times, and we have to handle many of the strains. So being a climate ambassador means that I also need to look at those other strains and, and, and kind of combine the ideas. I think there he very well explained also the meaning of green recovery and how mm -hmm. we work it in Finland at the European level. And that's also for a climate ambassador. Uh, it's the topic of the day because I think... Uh, I didn't like it in the beginning when people said it's an opportunity because I think when people are dying and you have a crisis, uh, use the word opportunity is wrong. But, mm. but it's opportunity in the sense that, that we need to build back better and greener, how we say it. Mm. Uh, because we realize that, that there, there needs to be a change of paradigm. So, so you set up the very well the, the scene. Um, I try to be short so we can have many mm. good discussions. Mm. In my work, I would first perhaps... Uh, emphasize the, the Nordic level. We work very much as a Nordic countries, and I think um, in foreign policy it's not always the case, and I'm happy to see that we really have a strong Nordic uh, kind of climate alliance. For example, yesterday we organized a meeting with some African states where we discussed uh, this building back greater and greener with our development ministers, and we will do the same in October with finance ministers between yeah. Nordics and Africa. Other level, we of course work. You also, I think, that mm. explained it very well. It's EU. Mm. Uh, we cannot have a Finnish climate diplomacy. We, we have a Nordic, we have a EU climate diplomacy. I kind of mm. jokingly mentioned to you mm. that actually today, uh, EU is demarching in London on, on climate uh, mm. climate change, uh, green recovery to be, to be specific. But I, I think it only shows the importance of the matter. We sent to all our delegations in the third countries. Uh, petition to do a demars, and I th we are doing it in China, we are doing it in Saudi Arabia, in all, all the countries. And, and I think, to put it shortly, uh, it's kind of the, the, the EU has the Green Deal. We have the message, we have a dual agenda of green and digital recovery. And, and uh, we believe that we can lead by example to perhaps green recovery summits with third countries and then kind of uh, extend our knowledge. So it's kind of leading by example and knowledge uh, at the EU level. Why we have to do this, uh, EU only produces, well only it's, we are all bad producers, but mm. emits, uh, gas emissions, it's about 9%, and China alone, 29%. So in a way, you can think that, that uh, whatever we do within Europe, it still doesn't save the global game. So, mm. so we need climate diplomacy and outreach uh, to, to, re to, to c come to our targets. Very briefly, I would also mentioned the meaning of United Nations. I think it's quite significant mm -hmm. that Antonio Guterres, they have a six-point agenda of how to build back better and greener. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to support as Nordics, as Finland, and as EU mm -hmm. countries, and European countries. Mm -hmm. UK, of course, has a very special role this because of the COP26. I think we need to support the, uh, the, the UN agenda. You mentioned you're doubling your climate finance. Mm -hmm. Finland, I think, needs to st study very carefully this also. It's in our government program that we increase our, our uh, for climate finance. We put to a fund called Green uh, Climate Fund, which I, I, I'm a board member. We had a full meeting last week, and Finland has put 100 million to that, and I think it's money very, very well spent, and there are some very significant projects. Lastly, just uh, this is more like a diplomat speaking, but I think the world is also branding, so... I often, often think, what do we have to offer for, for climate dialogue? And I would kind of highlight three issues in my, my agenda. One is circular economy. I think we have a very good background. Citra has been working this a lot. We are very good engineers as a country. I think we produce roadmaps and, and something. So I think to explain really that, that 
circular economy is more than recycling. It's, it's a whole ecosystem. Mm. It's a whole new way of looking at the things. This, we, all, we already do it in many countries, Chile, Vietnam, mm. uh, Canada. It's, it's part of our foreign policy, but, but kind of take this as a lead in our, our climate diplomacy. Mm. The other one is finance ministers, climate coalition. It's um, co-chaired by Finland and Chile. And there, I think, shortly the message is that it's not enough to get the, the climate, we sometimes call it climate bubble, if it's the mm. environment ministers and negotiators. They don't have the money, so we need to get the finance ministers mm. in the agenda. So, so the idea in the finance ministers' climate coalition is, I think, to have cross-sectoral approach mm. and have all the ministers involved. And lastly, important for me, I think it's Human Rights Council. Finland is a Nordic member. Uh, that the election will be done next year and then the membership will be from 2022. And I think more and more we realize, you mentioned the, the warming climate. Mm -hmm. uh, climate is a human right, so I think it's something that if we become, and we hope we will become members of the Human Rights Council, mm -hmm. we can also adva advance climate issues in this council. Okay. Uh, that's shortly what I would like to yeah, say. To thank, you, thank you very much. So uh, obviously a broad range of actions that well, Finland and Europe can take internationally to, to advance this agenda. Um, but you mentioned the bioeconomy world, and it's very fortunate we have an expert on the bio-circular economy, uh, Mark Pahahi. So you, perhaps you can say a few words about this, Mark, please. Over to you. Uh, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today in this uh, European Forum. And Ambassador, I would like to start my intervention by quoting one, one of the most influential persons of the 20th century, who was a British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, mm. who said, uh, never waste a good crisis. Mm. And I start with this because I really believe that we have a golden opportunity to use the COVID pandemic to reimagine our world and to rethink our economy so that in the future it prospers in harmony with nature, not against it. I think this is crucial because the current health, climate and biodiversity crisis are just different phases of the same fundamental problem, our economic system. A system that is addicted to fossil resources and to growth at all costs that has basically failed to value and incorporate our most important capital and the basis for human health and well-being, nature. In fact, scientists have alerted us for many years about the fact that the degradation of our natural ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity are main factors explaining the emergence and, and transmission to humans of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. So having arrived at the present tipping point, I think we need a new vision for our world, a new narrative for the future generations and a new strategy for Europe to reset our economy on a sustainable path. And obviously the, the EU Green Deal offers the best framework to do that because it tackles uh, most of the structural problems that have brought us here. However, in my opinion, in order to succeed, the EU Green Deal needs to address more holistically challenges such as climate change, uh, profitability, circularity, resource efficiency, biodiversity loss, because all these challenges are interrelated and therefore we need holistic solutions. And in that context, uh, the circular economy, which is one of the fundamental pillars of the, of the EU Green Deal, needs to be connected with a concept that is currently missing, the concept of the bioeconomy. The bioeconomy, remember that bio means life, is an economy relying on our living systems, relying on the understanding of the value of natural capital, the value of biodiversity, the value of managing sustainably our biological resources as basis for prosperity and well-being. And in a more practical sense, the bioeconomy is crucial because while the energy sector in the long run, long run can be fully decarbonized, still we will need to produce an increasing amount of food and materials to meet the, the needs of a growing global population. And those materials will still need to rely on carbon but if we want to move towards a climate neutral economy, as the Green Deal ambitions, that carbon, those materials will need to come predominantly from fossil free options. And to do that, we have only one alternative, to use sustainably our biological resources. The good news is that with emerging science and technology, 
we can transform sustainably our biological resources into a totally new range of bio-based solutions that can replace and environmentally outperform many fossil products and non-renewable materials from industrial sectors such as construction, textiles, chemicals, transport, packaging. This is what the bioeconomy can offer, substituting materials such as plastics, concrete and steel by renewable bio-based solutions. And of course, Finland is a pioneer country in that context. But we should not forget biological resources, even if they are renewable, they are not unlimited. And therefore their use and transformation needs to be intelligent, efficient, and above all sustainable. This is why the circular economy concept needs to be connected to the bioeconomy because the bioeconomy to succeed needs to be circular. But the opposite is also true. The bioeconomy offers great potential to modernize and make industrial sectors circular and renewable. Yeah? Because if you manage sustainable bio biological resources, they are circular and renewable by nature. This is why the circular economy and the bioeconomy need to each other. And why we should aim towards a circular bioeconomy paradigm. On a more fundamental basis, uh, the circular bioeconomy can be the best strategy to protect biodiversity. Because at the end of the day, a long-term sustainable circular bioeconomy requires healthy and resilient ecosystems. So in a way, biodiversity is a precondition for a bioeconomy. And therefore, investing on biodiversity should be a priority for any successful bioeconomy. So in a way, the circular bioeconomy provides us with an opportunity to, set, to rethink our economy so that it addresses its past failure to value nature and value biodiversity. It tries to connect the dots. And His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, defines the circular bioeconomy in a very nice way. He says that the circular bioeconomy is about bringing nature back at the center of our economy. It's about giving back to nature as much as nature gives to us. I think he defined this in a very nice way. And I am very happy that His Royal Highness has decided to establish the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, an alliance that aims at accelerating the transition towards the circular bioeconomy globally, connecting investors, companies, policymakers, and scientists. And I am especially happy that he has requested the European Forest Institute to coordinate the activities of the Alliance. So that is, uh, Ambassador, uh, a great pleasure for us at EFI. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, a really excellent example of, of taking things forward, but also of UK Finnish cooperation on, on, uh, on, uh, on these areas. You can't get higher than uh, the heir to the, heir to the throne in, in the UK. Um, do I have any questions from the audience on this important issue? While why you're thinking, either here or online, I was actually going to pose my colleagues a question which I had thought a bit before, which I'm going to change slightly, which is, um, I mean, Mark talked about the transformation required, frankly, in our, in our, on the way we do business, basically, to, to make a sustainable economy. Um, now, as we know, the, 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 the person, uh, you, you fortunately in Finland don't define their gender, the person on the uh, Helsinki tram or the person on the London bus, um, he or she is thinking about their relatives who are sick, maybe they're losing their jobs, they're not thinking about green transition. That's they're thinking about shorter term priorities. So how, how do we convince our publics, our electorates to take these steps, which mean quite big changes in the way they, 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 they uh, operate their lives, may mean paying more money for fuel and more money for the, the way they conduct themselves. How do we do that at a time when they've got really serious short term worries? That's for you first to address that question. Thank you. Um, well, I think you're, you're under underestimating our people. Yes. They actually are very concerned. Mm. They, they are concerned about the future of their children. I think many people are quite ready to take these measures. Many are taking measures voluntarily, but they would be even more ready to do it when they know that everybody is taking these uh, measures. So the more we are able to collectively agree, and that's where it's nice that... Um, we come together in COP26 and, mm. and we try to build that momentum and make sure that uh, um, we act also globally. But I think um, 
people are ready to act and, and uh, the, the question of fairness um, and just transition is, uh, is at the core. But I think uh, people are interested to, to work go. with it. Okay. So, so, I mean, obviously, I mean, in Finland, I mean, clearly this is a very, a country very much one with nature, or people very committed about nature. But that, frankly, is not the case in, all over the world. I mean, Jan, what do you think about internationally about this conundrum? I mean, if you're uh, in a developing country, you worry very much about where your next meal is going to come from and how, you're, and, and, and how, how do you persuade not just wealthier Europeans, but people around the world to take these necessary steps? Uh, pick up on what Terhi said on, on, on fair and trust, trust, just transition. Mm. I think it's a very global recipe for anything because mm. I, I think um, if we say to Finnish, the politicians would say we need to stop using peat. It's something negative. It has an impact on your working. But mm. if you say that we need to create green jobs in certain areas, it's a, it's a discourse where you kind of look at the uh, human needs and human-based solutions. So I think it's also like if you're in a poor situation in Africa, you need to provide solutions like cooking from, from solar or power or something so they don't need to use the wood, the little wood they have or something. So it's kind of providing solutions with kind of uh, starting from the human being. So I think in a way I would in that sense agree with Terry. It's kind of the tr tr trust transition. This is very key in this So, this so there is popular support, do you think, around the world for these, these measures? Uh, I think more and more. It's, it's kind of, um, I was explaining first like the alliances we make, but I think we also need to talk with people who don't believe in, in kind of mm. a, putting money on climate change because it, and it has to do with the whole, I think, uh, going in the market. I think you put it very well, like the, the how do we change to, to, to bioeconomy and mm. then a kind of circular bioeconomy, that, that the parameters are different now. And there are some international actors and some states even who, who, who their logic is still different. So we need to kind of uh, continue the dialogue of, of green recovery and then how, how this kind of, uh, we don't have a, choice first of all, but, but kind of uh, make everybody realize that this is actually good for our people, it's good for our youth, mm. young and, and, and also for our health. So it's, it's, it's continuing. Uh, I, I, in a way also, this morning I was talking to Beijing and we were trying to see that if we could organize kind of a East uh, China uh, Nordics dialogue on green recovery and I think just do those kind of things because we live in a moment when we cannot travel and do mm. the classical diplomacy and go and, and knock on the door of the foreign ministry but perhaps we can have more moments like what we are having now with also our kind of uh, constituencies is on the south you know mm. that, that's something we, we can work on so it's it's okay. uh, it's, it's um, public diplomacy is also important in, 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 in climate change. Okay yeah and thank you. Mark, Mark what do you think about this I mean how do you again I mean, I know you're, you have projects in the developing world, but it, you know, it, it's easier for people in this part of the globe to make sacrifices than if you're uh, earning two dollars a day in a, on a specific island. I mean, how, how do you advance this agenda in your, in your view? I, I think this is a very good question, Ambassador, and I think we need to emphasize that this uh, new economic paradigm that we need can be more fair, more inclusive, more equal. And in fact, we have clear facts about that. If you look how biological resources, for example, agriculture, forestry, are distributed and owned, uh, they are much more distributed along the territory. So it is easier to distribute jobs, infrastructures, and prosperity based on a circular bioeconomy than based on a fossil economy. Look who is owning fossil resources at the end of the day and where they are located. So I give you an example from the EU Green Deal. Uh, the forestry sector in Europe provides 3.5 million jobs. If you put together the chemicals, the cement and the steel industry, all together, they are much less than that these 3.5 million. They don't, they don't even get to 1 million together. Many people don't know that. And this is about inclusive prosperity. Uh, the forest sector in Europe includes 400,000 uh, small and medium enterprises. This is an, ama an ama amazing fabric in the territory. So I think uh, your point is very correct. And many times we need to start the discussion with people with the jobs, because at the end of the day, we need a, a new paradigm that is also fair and more equal and that distributes prosperity in a, in a better way than we have been doing in the past. And we have a great opportunity because the fossil economy, uh, we have seen that has resulted in, in big inequalities. Yes, yes. Okay, that's good. Any questions from the audience? Want to come in? No, or on the screen? 
Perhaps I can go back to you, Jan. I mean, another question for you, Jan, particularly, and maybe those will have views. I mean, we, we, we are seeing um, in the world, frankly, greater competition between powers. And it's, it's no secret the international system is under quite a lot of stress due to competition between powers. Uh, and some of that is becoming more acute uh, in many areas. We're seeing this in technology, for example. We're seeing it physically. Um, now, clearly, as we say, we, we, these emergencies I described are common to all of us. Yeah. How do we actually come up with a collective agreement at COP in 26, which somehow gets away from these, these divisions? Uh, because I, I, I know it, it, many countries see uh, you know, their, their foreign engagement as a sort of unified portfolio. So how, how do we persuade some of these countries, and I, I know you all know who they are, uh, how, how do we persuade them to take this really seriously and commit and separate green issues from perhaps issues of security or national interest in other areas? It's a very good moment. It's kind of, uh, I think, the Paris Agreement 2015, there was a momentum. There was kind of a, perhaps the two big players, they were different mode than they are today. So, so we are in a very difficult setting because I think China and US, they are not on very friendly relations. And I think we need dialogue between those two, two big powers. And, and I think European actors, not only you, but, but COP presidency, mm. I think we have a huge role in doing that. A lot depends on what happens in, in, in elections, uh, 3rd of November, I think that, that, that we need to also start perhaps looking that, that be ready because, because if, if, if the moment and the situation is different, we don't have much time until November 21 for negotiations. Mm. So, so one is to look at perhaps the country where, where you have elections, uh, United States, 3rd of November, really see how, 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 how the, the, the Biden teams climate agenda, what mm. is it and what can we do together. So it's, I think it's something we need to start studying now as, as we speak. And uh, for my last posting was China and in a way kind of looking like um, the experience I had last week from, from my, my board meetings and mm. something that it's, uh, I think the willingness is there for climate change and they, they have a green recovery uh, dialogue. Mm. And, and, and this course. So, so if we get some kind of good momentum, and this is somewhere I think where, where we all need to work together very much mm. with the COP26 presidency, how do we build the, the, the kind of roadmap to, to, to COP26 that involves the global discussion? Uh, I think Mark said the same very well in, in kind of what is circular bioeconomy. And then you would need to start looking at the big events. There is a big circular economy uh, summit. It's v virtual now, of course, but in September, and then Netherlands has one in May, and then Canada in October, and then again biodiversity. The most likely, it's not decided yet, but it will be April or, or May, and it will be, I think, significantly in China. So, kind of have a look at the COP26 roadmap. What, what are the different steps? Also in the finance track, I think there is a lot with, with finance ministers, which is for us important. But, but kind of uh, look at this bits and pieces and involve and interlink the international dialogue. It's, it's a very difficult task because even just, I mentioned the demands on mm. green recovery and even in the response to that is, is in ambiguous in some places. But, 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 but if we want to have like a European discourse on these four crises of environment, biodiversity, climate and health, mm. uh, it's, it's even more challenging, but I think it's something we need to do. Okay, okay. So there's, there's, there, are, there are many hurdles to cross, but we can get to the finishing line, you're suggesting. Yes, 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 yes. So actually, coming back to you, another mm. question for you, Tahi. I mean, I, I'm, I'm struck. Obviously, we have um, climate strikes in many countries, including in the mm. UK. We have, obviously, Greta Thunberg, who's been a great activist. Mm. There does seem to be a bit of a generational gap here uh, on climate issues. And, and we all know that um, European societies are, are aging quite rapidly. In fact, I think Finland has a lower birth rate than Japan, in mm -hmm. fact, at the moment. I mean, ha, ha, we, with the young, the young, the youth, I mean, my kids are, are fairly inspired about, about the climate. Ha, how do we inspire the oldies, you know, people like us, or people older than us, to come out and get behind this? Because if they don't get behind it, again, how do we get this transformation going? Well, I think, I think the youth did, I mean, look at the last elections mm. in Europe, the European elections, uh, the, the Finnish elections, I think there was a, a wave of um, climate debates and, and the youth, look, our government has a, uh, an, a goal to be climate neutral by 2035. Mm. Uh, I don't think any, any one of us 
uh, five years ago would have thought that this could be uh, true. I was, we were talking earlier that um, actually Finland, I mean, we have our forest and, and we have a, a carbon sink, but we also have a very um, energy intensive industry. Mm. Uh, our, our distances are, are long. We have cold winters. It's actually, mm. we're quite quite a bad pupil in many ways in, when it comes to mm. greenhouse gas emissions. And, and if we can go climate neutral by 2035, e everyone can. And we have uh, taken this, I think it was the youth that somehow tipped us. And, mm. But then it's now, look at the business community in, in this country. Uh, look at the innovators, the, the forward. So once we get the economy, and I think when you were talking about earlier, how do we... How do, we, how do you <laughs> and how do we pull this together? Uh, every country in this world has an interest to um, come uh, that the, the climate changes is or catastrophic climate change is uh, avoided. Every, but every country might have a little interest in ensuring that others do more of the effort, but it's actually the future economy is also in those solutions. So this is also on the agenda of, of the big powers. And I must say that when we talk about the developing countries and poor there, it's, it's not those people that are going to be the first ones that need to act, but actually they are the ones that are mm. going to be the earliest ones to suffer from the consequences of climate change. And I think there is... Um, so the solutions exist. We just have to gear the economy to the right way. And the, the problem is that we've spent a lot of the time uh, that was available to us to this do this more uh, or less disruptively. And I think we have to just be... Uh, more prepared, but uh, it's true that the, the youth have um, taken the lead, um, but I think they're asking the right questions, and, and if they have gotten this country around, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll bring the rest bring, of... Bring, bring yeah. with you, yes, yes. What do, what do you think, Mark, about this demographic issue? Because, I mean, your, 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 your pitch, you know, I find that really engaging, imaginative, and vibrant, and... You know, that, that comes across really well. But as you say, there's a whole section of the population. I'm not, I'm not tarring people, but how, how, do you, how do you get to everybody with this vision? Yeah, that's a good, a good point. I think we are lucky that the youth is taking here the lead because they are the future, the future generation. So it, it is crucial that they are really taking the lead and, and believing on, on a, new, a new world. And sometimes to convince people, you need to use taxes. It's, a, it's as simple as that, you know. Uh, we are in a, in a moment of transformation and we also need to provide the right incentives to society to go in the right direction. And for example, uh, something as simple and as complex as uh, a CO2 price, you know, pricing carbon emissions in, in our products, in, in energy, that would already shift behavior. In the UK, you have very good experience, for example, with taxing sugar drinks, mm. and you could see a decrease already in consumption of sugar drinks because there was a taxation. So I think we, we cannot be naive and, and we need also to, to regulate, you know, because there are many market failures and the task of, of policymakers is really to, to internalize the, the environmental cost of our economy. Otherwise, we are not going to, to, to move forward. So. Uh, pedagogy is important, but, uh, you know, the carrot and the stick, you need also the right regulations to, to change behavior. Okay, so regulation clearly is very, very important in this. In this uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in the UK, we have something called the nudge concept. So, obviously, you can regulate, but also you sort of encourage people to, to move towards, yeah. uh, for example, in this case, a greener, a greener future, and that's important. But we're sort of coming towards the end of our discussion, but come out to Jan, back to you, Jan. I mean, uh, you know, uh, w w when we sit in our ministries, we worry a lot about risk. So you know, obviously we, we have our vision of a successful COP. We have our vision of getting to 2030 in a better place. What, what are the really big, what are the sharks out there next to the, you know, what, what's next to the canoe that's going to upset this great, uh, our great plan? And, and how do we deal with that? What, what's your view on that question? Kind of the big shark in my table as a climate ambassador. And I, I think it's a fascinating discussion in our remit is kind of a, if we if and when we accept the, the IPCC uh, statement that, that we can only uh, the world can only get warmer 1.5 degrees that's maximum basically or, or very close to two. but then then to in order to get to that point we need to be globally net zero by 2050 and then when you have a 
the first com common is, as you said, UK is 2050 mm -hmm. and Europe is 2050, we all know, during the Finnish presidency. So, so you already start having the discussion from some countries, well, well if you are so progressive, uh, it's kind of the, the, the same but different say, the, the, um, approach to, to, to this discussion. You have countries who say, well, what we do 2060 goals. So it's fr how difficult this was to get kind of the European um, target 2050 in December. So I'm kind of having the, the not the nightmare, but kind of the worry that how do we do the global 2050 discussion? And mm. that's going on now between the, the big powers. I think like I was reading Financial Times, I think Biden already said 2050. So you're getting people who are bidding already to 2050, but, but, but uh, when do we have the global 2050? Because really it's a, it's a tricky game and it's a difficult game. So that's, uh, I think, my mind. Okay, okay. So, so I suppose the question is what is, what is good enough is the classic, the classic governmental problem. <laughs> is what yes. is good enough and, uh, and can we actually, actually deliver that? Okay, right. Um, this point really, I mean, we've got about four minutes left, so I was going to really give a sort of minute to each of you to think about, you know, concretely, we've had, we've had, we've had a great discussion, um, uh, quite policy heavy, concretely, what can you know, we do to deliver this greener, healthier, um, uh, wealthier target in, in 2030? What are the real core actions for, for you today? What do you think? I'm going to pull together yes. a little bit what Mark and Jan yes. said first, but I'm going to say science-based, set yourself science-based targets mm -hmm. and, uh, and give yourself market-based measures to mm. achieve it. Mm. Um, we can, with the COVID recovery funding, we can direct, we can, we can support the economy, we can move, we can pilot, we can nudge with public resources, but you need to have the carbon prices, the market signals, be it par you know, if, if you're a city, it could be uh, parking uh, mm. fees, uh, but uh, give yourself a market-based, make sure that the market works for you. Okay, market-based solutions, science and market. Right, Jan, what do you think? Uh, Human-centered based solutions. I went a couple of weeks ago, there it was uh, Extinction Rebellion, they were on a hunger strike in front of the parliament, and actually there was somebody who was already retired, so they were not only young people, it was all over, but, but kind of, uh, when we do our plans, I, I said it before also, but, the, the, but let's not say like that we need to stop peat, but we say like let's create green jobs. It's kind of a just transition, but also put always human in, in the center, wherever you are in the world, if you're a Greta Thunberg or if you are somebody in a developing country in difficult conditions, but, but kind of look at the solutions, not from a kind of abstract policy, climate policy, but, but how, how do we relate to this person's uh, natural environment. Okay, human-based solutions. Mark, what, what, do you, what do you think? What is the real concrete action in your particular bioeconomy field? I, I was thinking of something more abstract, but I think very important. And I would like to quote here Nelson Mandela. And being in Finland, I think it is very appropriate. He said that the most powerful weapon to transform the world is education. And I think education, really, we are in a times of transformational change. And I think education is, is really crucial to educate the future generations because we need to create a totally new world and um, education is key. I think, uh, and I think Finland is a good example of that. Investing in education is an, inv is an investment in the future economy, is an investment in health, is an investment in nature. I think it's something that Finland also could export in the future much more. Okay, so so we we need, we need to teach teach well not just the young but everybody about 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 climate change and the, and the impacts. Yes, I think one of the best things actually I saw in Finland, I, there was an exhibition at the Espo Arts Gallery, which uh, was of photographs of glaciers, I think, in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you want to show anybody the rate of climate change, that's one thing which is a real canary in the coal mine and really uh, has quite a stark impact, actually. And, and uh, I, 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 for, for, uh, uh, for some, uh, for many Finns who are, are great skiers, the fact there was no snow in Helsinki <laughs> this, this year is quite a signifier of how things are actually moving very fast. Uh, so we really need to get cracking, I think. Um, so to sum up, really, um, I mean, I think at the moment we are, are sadly a bit poorer at the moment. Uh, we're a mixed health, um, corona, but actually being forced to cycle to work makes mm. us a bit fitter. Uh, and uh, we also are becoming greener. So there is a lot of hope. Thank you very much.
to my panel for coming along, a very good discussion, and uh, let's all hope for success at COP. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.